In the second year, in the second month, on the twentieth day of the month, the cloud lifted over from the tabernacle of the testimony. And the people of Israel set out by stages from the wilderness of Sinai. And the cloud settled down in the wilderness of Paran. They set out for the first time at the command of the Lord by Moses. And Moses said to Hobab, the son of Ruel the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, We are setting out for the place to which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us, and we will do good to you, for the Lord has promised good to Israel. But he said to him, I will not go. I will depart to my own land and to my kindred. And he said, Please do not leave us, for you know where we should camp in the wilderness, and you will serve us as eyes for us. And if you do go with us, whatever good the Lord will do to us, the same will do to you. So they set out from the mount of the Lord three days' journey, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them three days' journey to seek out a resting place for them. And the cloud of the Lord was over them by day, whenever they set out from the camp. And whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, to the ten thousand thousands of Israel. Well, good morning, folks. Um, moving a, moving just a little gingerly this morning, a bit uh, over vigorous in the vegetable garden the other day, so... Um, if I uh, take a stumble, that's, that's all that it's about. So. But uh, here we are. Wonderful passage of God's word, that, from, from the book of, of Numbers. Uh, you come across lovely little gems when you read consistently through the scriptures. Um, the book of Numbers, you might think, well, that's a book that appeals to an accountant. It does, of course. <laughs> all sorts of lovely subtotals and totals and... But there's, there's so much more, of course, isn't there, about the book of Numbers. It's a lovely picture to us of the of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. A great, great picture that's painted for us here in Numbers chapter 10. The, the people of, of Israel had been camped for the best part of a year now, but the time had come for them to move on. The time had come for them to follow that great pillar of cloud that was there, that's, uh, that uh, evidence of the Lord going before them. And so they break camp. What a thrilling day that must have been. You can get the sense of the buzz around the whole camp that's there in the second year, the second uh, in the second month, on the 20th day of the month, the cloud lifted from over the tabernacle of the testimony and the people of Israel set out by stages. And then we've got these descriptions going on in the next few verses how, of how each group, each, uh, each uh, clan and tribe moved on in that way. A thrilling scene. Must have been wonderful for Moses to be able to stand there and see all that, see those, those, those banners of the various tribes rippling there in the breeze and all the, all the um, motion around the camp is now, finally, it's time, time to move on. Now, this is a picture of the church because these were people who were redeemed by blood. These were people who had been brought out from the tyranny of, of, of Egypt. Uh, they had sheltered under the, the blood that was spread on the lentils and the doorposts that night as the, as the angel of death had passed through Egypt. Those who trusted in the promise of God were those who were kept safe from the angel of, of death. And now the Lord had brought them out of Egypt with a mighty arm, and here they are moving, moving on. That's a picture of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who we are. We are those who, redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, are journeying on to a promised destination. God is our guide, leading us on every step of the journey. And we wish for all who we love to come with us. 
So we'll look at verse 29 in particular of Numbers chapter 10 today. Moses said to Hobab, the son of Rule, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we are setting out for the place of which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us and we will do good to you. For the Lord has promised good to Israel. Isn't that a lovely summary of what the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is in the world today? Let's just think about those two things. Here we are traveling to our destination. We want all whom we love to come with us. So first thing, here we are away from home. We're not home. This world is, is not our home. Home is a, a wonderful thought, isn't it? We've sung a couple of times today in the songs that we're singing. You might have noticed them. I certainly noticed them because there's a picture on this theme, so those words stand out. We're talking about, about home. Thoughts of home are really embedded in the soul of all people. Poets love to talk about home. Home is where the heart is. I wish I was homeward bound. Home is, is that precious thought for us, isn't it? Well, Israel, of course, Israel had been brought out of Egypt, brought out of that terrible, desperate situation for more than 400 years. The people of Israel had been in Egypt, started out well, finished up in a, in a terrible time for them, and that awful slavery that was there. Generations had come and been born and had died. There was stories handed down of, of what that land of, of their forefathers had been, but that's so, so far away. No one knew about it. No one, no one knew what the land looked like. And now they've been set free from all of that. The Lord had heard the cries of his people and he'd come and he'd rescued them from that tyranny of Egypt. And now they're free from all that. Here they are in this desert camp and there'd been wonderful things that had happened over the course of that past year. But the desert camp was not their home. They knew that they were going somewhere else. They knew that there was a destination for them. How did they know that? Well, they knew it because... The Lord had told them so. How do we know that we have a home beyond the grave? How do we know that? We know it because the Lord has said, the Lord said, we are going, setting out for the place of which the Lord said, I will give it to you. What a wonderful promise that is. That makes it surer than anything. That's how we know it's so because the Lord has said that it is so. The Lord who is the creator of this whole physical universe Lord, the creator of the soaring mountains and the raging seas, God who is the creator of the whole uh, universe, God who holds all things in his hand, God who calls the stars by name, God who created the whole physical universe, is God who is the creator of heaven. And he says, I'll give it to you. I will give it to you. What a wonderful promise that is. It's his to give. He made it. He rules it. He made it for his people and he says, I'll give it to you. It's not something that you'll earn. Christians aren't people who earn their way to a glorious future. We don't deserve it. Oh, but heaven is his to give. And he promises to give it. He says he will give it. And we wonder what lies ahead. What exactly lies ahead for us? What is this place of heaven? What is this destination to which we are moving? Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for us. We get some wonderful pictures that are painted uh, for us in the scripture, but all of those are our only pictures. We can't begin to imagine. Let your imagination run riot, if you like but exceedingly abundant above all the things we can ask or even imagine so much God has prepared for us. We believe that on the authority of God's word, on the authority of God's unbreakable word, we who have come to trust in that promise are confident that he will fulfill that promise. Because all who took refuge in the blood there in Egypt, all those were saved, all those were brought safely out of Egypt, all of those were those who were redeemed by the mighty arm of God. All of those 
were those who even now were being led by the Spirit of God through the wilderness, all of those who have trusted in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, all of those in whom dwells the Spirit of the living God, all of those on the authority of God's word we can say, all of those will be brought safe home to the glory. Writer to the Hebrews paints this lovely picture for us where he puts these words in the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ in Hebrews 2 and verse 13 where he says, Behold, I and the children God has given me. Our Lord Jesus Christ, entering into glory, goes with all those whom the Lord has given to him. The Lord said, and so we're on a journey. This Christian life to which we are called is, is a journey. We're not settling down here. This is not the end. This is not all that God has prepared for us. And sometimes the journey is hard. We know that to be the case. We, You've known that from personal experience. Sometimes the journey's hard. Like the people of Israel, they, they came to the, to the bitter waters of Mara on that occasion. They'd be going so long and there's the prospect, water finally to drink. They taste that water and it's bitter. Grief and disappointment, hardships along the way. Perhaps you've experienced that. Then the people of, of Israel came after that to the sweet, sweet waters of Elam. They came to that beautiful place where, yes, there was springs of fresh water and palm trees all beside the flowing water. Beautiful place. And sometimes we've known that. Sometimes we've known the, our Christian experience to be like that as well. Wonderful high times of blessing. Wonderful times with Christian friends and family and all the mercies of God times and we've thought this surely is heaven on earth but that's not the end we are always moving on always moving on we we need to look on this life this life that we're living right now with the eye of a traveler we look around and we can say yes there are hard things but I'm not staying here yes there are beautiful things but I'm not going to be distracted by all of that there are so many different sights so many different experiences through this life but that's not what this life is about set your affections on things above the scripture says set your affections on home you are homeward bound make home to be ever more precious for you and what awaits what awaits us? There's nothing here to compare with what awaits us. First Peter 1 verse 4, what are we looking forward to? We're looking forward to an inheritance that is imperishable and undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. And some of our friends are already there. We've said our goodbyes to friends who are already there, loved ones who... We've known and they've been on the journey with us and they've parted company with us. They've gone home. It's, it was hard. It's hard to say goodbye to dear friends, isn't it? But we don't grieve as unbelievers grieve. I'm thinking of a dear sister who the, uh, the, the, the last uh, part of her life was, uh, was wracked by awful pain. And as she lay dying in the arms of her husband, she said, oh, Sid, I just want to go home. And we think of things like that, and it moves us. But she is home on the authority of God's word. And we think of our friends who have gone before, and there they are rejoicing in the presence of the Lord. And we think of all those who have gone before us, Brothers and sisters in the Lord, we don't even know, but the writer to the Hebrews tells us that there's this great cloud of witnesses in heaven who are encouraging us onwards. Don't give up. Keep moving. And so secondly, yes, we have this home. Secondly, every step brings us nearer home. Isn't that the reality about our Christian experience? Every step we take brings us nearer home. Paul says to the Romans in chapter 13 and verse 11 that we are, our salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Now you've got to have two fixed points to be able to say something is nearer today than it was then. Both fixed points. The day you believed, the destination, it's nearer. Today you're closer to home than you were yesterday. 
the days of our journey are speeding on to an end. Time is flying by. Are you weary? Weary in the walking? Lift up your eyes. Remember where you're going. Remember what the journey's about. Don't get distracted by the difficulties of the journey to, to forget what the journey's end is. Now, maybe you're early in the journey. Maybe you're a, a young Christian. Maybe you're someone who hasn't been in the faith long. And you, you, How are you going to last a distance? How are you going to keep going? I say, keep the travel guide close to you. Keep the encouragements close to you. Keep the word of God close to you. Read the word of God and profit from it. And the diff things difficult to understand, keep coming back to them. The word of God is precious to God's people. All scripture is profitable for us, for rebuke and for teaching and for training in righteousness. Read the word of God, profit from it. Let your faith grow. That faith that took hold of the promise, first of all, the promise that said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And you did that. You've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You've put your trust in him. Well, keep on trusting. Let that faith grow. The more you journey on, of course, the more you're aware of your weakness, the more you're aware of your sin. Ah, yes, but at the same time, the more you are aware of the mighty, sustaining power of your God, your heart belongs to him, you belong to him, and all the resources that he's given to us in the Lord Jesus Christ, use all of those resources. He's blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus there in order that you might press on in the journey. Or maybe you're near the end. Maybe now you're closer, closer to the end of the journey than, than the beginning. There are many, many difficulties towards the end of the journey. How hard it is. It's, it, it does seem to be so hard, isn't it? The, 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 the latter part of this journey is so much harder. The energy's wavering and, and there are physical attacks and there are attacks even on the faith as well. You know all that to be the case. Don't look back. Don't look back now. You're nearly there. Soon your eyes will close in death. That is true. One time your eyes will close, and that'll be the last time they'll close on this earth. But when they open, they'll open in the glory. Here we are on this beautiful last Sunday of July. Winter's nearly over. Hey, we can sense it, can't we? Can sense, sense that it's there. You smell the fragrance of spring. Can you smell the fragrance of heaven? Andre reminded us before about the sounds of the glorious music of heaven. Can you hear the sounds of the redeemed in heaven singing now? Glory to the Lamb. Your older brother's already gone. Our Lord Jesus Christ, your older brother, he's there already. He who came from heaven to seek and to save that which was lost. He's gone. He's returned. He's there in the heaven now. But he said, I go to prepare a place for you. We're all on this journey through this life. Like I say to an unbeliever, you're journeying through life as well. Well, look, here are the people of God. Ask them, why don't they just want to stick around and enjoy the show here? Why is it they, they don't want to join in with those things that are, are so important to you? They're flesh and blood like you. They have the same cares and concerns, the same sorts of things they have to deal with in, in ordinary life, same enjoyments. You ask them. You ask a Christian. If you're an unbeliever today, you ask a Christian. Why are they ready to leave all of that? Why does all this glittering world seem so insignificant to them when they consider this place they're setting out to? What is it at the end of the journey that makes it all worthwhile? I'd say that to any, anyone who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask a Christian, why are you a Christian? Because soon you too will draw your last breath. 
Christian, this journey is our most important business. The most important business that we're about as we live this life is this journey. We are setting out. Now, that's what Moses says. We are setting out. We're not considering it. We're not tossing up the options and we're not wondering whether it might be a good idea or not. We're doing it. This is deliberate. This is determined. There's no hesitation. There's no turning back. There'll be no distractions from this. This is what we're doing. Now, this one thing I do, the Apostle Paul could say, forgetting what lies behind, I press on for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Press on, friends. That's what I say to us each one. Press on. And that means practically that every plan you have every choice that you make, every decision that you make. You weigh it up in this. Is this going to help me or is it going to hinder me on this journey that I'm called to? Help me or hinder me. Here's the way to make decisions. Over in chapter 33 of, of, this, of this book of Numbers, Moses gives us a detailed account of what this journey was. He kept a travel diary. He wrote down the places that they went. The very interesting thing about it, and I don't want to spend too much time here, but just to point, take, take note of this, that uh, these are the stages of the, of the people of Israel, and they went out, and Moses wrote it all down, and he says time and again, the people of Israel set out from Ramesses and camped at Sukkoth, and they set out from Sukkoth and camped at Etham. They set out from A and they camped at B. They set out from B and they camped at C all the way through, every place they stopped. And you might think, Moses, if you're writing a travel diary, that's not telling us very much about those places at all. Looking for places that we might want to retire, might want to settle down. There's no information there about that at all. That wasn't Moses' purpose. Moses' purpose was to show the journey. There were stages on the journey. Were the temptations to settle down at some stage, perhaps, but Moses gives no, dis no, no description of these places. Why? Because here we have no continuing city. And I ask you, what about the stages of your life? The stages of life that you have passed through. You began well. Oh, what a wonderful thing it was that day when Jesus opened your eyes to see the truth. Jesus opened your heart to trust in him. There's been a hard, long slog since then. Your legs are weary, maybe. Temptation's there. Take it easy. Don't be too hard on yourself. Don't push yourself too hard. Did you maybe get distracted along the way? There are warnings about that in Scripture. There are warnings. Paul talks about Demas, who, because he was in love with this present world, has abandoned me. Don't give up now. Press on. Our business here is to get there. Our business here in this world is to get there. We are doing this, Moses says. And so he turns finally to his brother-in-law. He turns to Hobab and he speaks to him. And what he says to him is what we say to our friends, to our loved ones, to our family. We want you to be there. We want you to be there with us. Hobab's his brother-in-law, son of Rule the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law. <clears throat> when, when Moses Escaped from Egypt, first of all, the first time he had to run and hide in the, in, in the desert. Forty years, uh, 40 years, it might seem like lost years before he got the call of God to go back to be the one who would lead his people out of, out of Egypt. But during those 40 years, he's in, in that place. This man, Hobab, his brother-in-law, had been with him all that time. What conversations they must have had. What an amazing relationship they must have had. They'd work together. You get to know people when you work with people. For 40 years they'd worked together. They'd shorn the sheep and they'd, they'd tended the fences and they'd done all those things that 
that, that farmers do over 40 years of all of that. And now Moses had had the call of God to go back to Egypt. He comes out now with the people as the Lord has promised. Here they are. And, and Hobab comes out to the desert to meet him where he is. Comes out to catch up with his brother-in-law again. What wonderful conversations they must have had then as Moses told about all the mighty works of God, how God had brought his people out in this way, the, the, the great signs that had been performed, the Passover, the promise of the promised land, all that was there. And Moses turns to his brother-in-law, turns to Hobab, turns to his wife's brother, and he said, Come with us. We are setting out. We're not going to, it's happening now. You can see what's happening. You can see the clouds gone on. You can see that already the tribes are moving out. We're going. This is happening. We won't be here tomorrow. Come with us. I want you to be there. I want you to come to the place of everlasting blessing and glory. God has promised it. I don't want you to die in the wilderness. I don't want you to go back to the farm and mould out the rest of your life there. Come with us. There's room. There's room for you. There's plenty of room. We're going. We're going now. Not tomorrow. Tomorrow will be gone. Tomorrow there will be no trace of us. You won't see the, 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 cloud, the cloudy pillar there because it will be gone on. You won't know where to go. You won't know which way to look. Today we're going. Come with us now, he says. Tomorrow will be too late. Don't be almost persuaded to follow. Almost persuaded is not good enough. Come with us now. And Moses says, and here's this great commitment that he makes on behalf of all of the people of God. He says, we will do good to you. Come with us and we will do good to you. Good. You'll have to leave everything behind to join us. And we honestly, we don't know what obstacles are ahead. We don't know what opposition lies ahead. We don't know what temptations we'll meet with in the way. All we know is what the destination is. All we know is that it were a well-spent journey, those seven deaths lay between. We don't know what opposition we're going to face in this Christian life either. Here, perhaps we find the difficulties of public opinion against us. We don't like that different stages in history, different places in the world even now, is far, far worse than that that Christians are facing. Hostility, outright aggression, violence. We don't know what lies ahead in the immediate future, but we do know the destination and we do know that it's, it's worthwhile. We will do good to you. Come with us and we'll do good to you. We know that God will be with us. We know that he will guide us. We know that he will provide for us. We're convinced of this. Hobab, do you think, do you think I would ask you to come with us on a journey to do you harm? Do you think that you'll be the loser if you come with us? You say to your Christian friends and loved ones, come with us. We will do good to you. And why do, how can we say that? On what authority can we say that? We can say it because the Lord has promised good to Israel. That's where all our good comes from. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He has done that. And because of that, and we know that and we've experienced that, you will share those blessings as well. We will do good to you because you will share in all the blessings we have known. Every blessing that the people of God know here below, you will know. You will know forgiveness. What a wonderful thing it is to know forgiveness, to know that you're right with the holy God of heaven. To know peace with God, to know there's no opposition there between you and God, to know the peace of God. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Moses is speaking there on behalf of all of the people of God, and he says, look around, we, all of us, we'll do you good. It'll be good for you to come and join the people of God. That's a commitment that Moses makes on behalf of all the people of God. That's a commitment that we can make on behalf of all of the church, of any 
Come and join with us. Come with us and we will do you good. Freely you have received. Freely give. There was an occasion, a young man, young, a young uh, a preacher by the name of Apollos, and he was preaching the gospel. An elderly couple, a lovely elderly couple, Priscilla and Aquila, heard him speaking. And they took him aside gently and they explained to him more clearly the way of the Lord. They were helpers to him along the way. You think of all the helpers that you have known along the way, everyone who's helped you on the journey this far. How many have done good to you? That's the testimony of the Christian, isn't it? How many kind helpers we have had along the main way? Maybe you were there at your, at your bitter waters of Mara. It was a time of great disappointment and heartache and grief and it seemed utterly unbearable and you, you couldn't think of putting another step in, uh, in, in front of the other. All of your hopes had come crashing down and you thought this is absolutely hopeless. Bitter, bitter waters that you've tasted. Maybe you've known that. And then what happened? A dear Christian friend came and stood with you and wept silent tears with you. And then gently, gently pointed you to the cross, pointed you again to the Lord Jesus Christ pointed you to the one who came from heaven to seek and to save that which was lost. And they said, keep on, keep on trusting. And as Moses threw that log into the water, the bitter waters of Marah, and those waters became sweet, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ made even the bitterest experiences of your life to be sweet. Thank God for Christian friends like that. Or maybe you'd come to your Elam, you'd come to that place where everything was, was beautiful and and pleasant, and you thought, I'm going to settle down here, and the, the lights of this world were so attractive to you. There was so much that was, that was pleasant, and the world was closing in on you. The world here, and along came a dear Christian friend and reminded you again of the calling that is yours to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and to keep on. Thank God for good friends. Christian, will you say to your friends, to your loved ones, come with us? You might say, well, I can't make arguments like that. I, I can't speak. I talk with people and they talk around me and they talk over me and I, I get home and an hour later I think of all the clever things I should have said but it's too late then. I can't speak. The one who said this to Hobab was Moses. That was exactly the argument that Moses had with the Lord. Remember when the Lord called him and he said, you go back to Egypt and set my people free, and Moses says, I can't speak. What a wonderful speech this was. Pretty simple. This is where we're going. We're really going. Come with us. That's not too hard to say that. That's not too hard to talk about what is most precious to you. Oh, friends, we're going home. And our message to all who see us going home is come with us. Well, may God bless his word to our hearts. Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep. Thank you that he is leading his people safe home. Father, we Thank you for all the precious memories of the, the journey thus far. Father, thank you that all that fades, fades into the background as we consider the glory of what lies ahead. Thank you for all those foretastes of glory. Thank you for those reminders of your word. Thank you for the preciousness even of, of the Lord's day, this, this day of, of rest, this day which reminds us that we do have an everlasting rest stretching out before us. Thank you that indeed it is the Lord who is all the glory of Emmanuel's land, uh, Emmanuel's land. We ask our Father that you would keep us in the way, strengthen us and make us to be useful servants of the Lord Jesus Christ along the way. We ask it in his name and for his sake. Amen.